In early 1993, the hype around black metal in Norway was still going strong. Despite this, Euronymous, his label, and his record store were suffering from financial setbacks. In order to generate even more publicity for the black metal scene and potentially attract new customers to Helvet, Euronymous and Varg came up with a plan in which Varg would do an anonymous interview with a journalist for a local newspaper in Bergen in January 1993. The Bergen's Tinde. In the interview, Varg exaggerated the prominence of Satanism among members of the original Norwegian black metal scene and claimed they were responsible for burning all the churches, promised more church burnings would happen, and they were doing this to spread satanic terror among the Christians. He also claimed he was the one who killed somebody in Lilyhammer. Varg played the journalist like a fiddle, though he didn't reveal anything that could prove his guilt. Well, that's when we started to hos den merkeligste person jeg til nå har truffet i mitt liv. Det var totalt mørkt i leiligheten, og vi traff en person med veldig langt mørkt hår, kledd i, i veldig mørke klær, med underlige symboler på. Leiligheten var preg av at uh, her bodde det en person som ikke kunne karakterisere som vanlig. Musikeren fortalte at han var djeveldyrker og satanist. I tillegg fikk Tønder etter hvert mange detaljer om hvordan flere kirker skulle ha blitt påtent. Han ble også fortalt at djeveldyrkermiljøet stod bak et drap på Lillehammer. Om Fantoftbranden fikk han vite at haren som var funnet hadde blitt halshuget på kirketrappen. Intervjuet skulle være anonymt, og Bergens tidenes fotograf fikk ikke lov til å ta bilder. Men under påskudd om at de måtte ha bevis overfor redaktøren i Bergens tidene, lot musikeren seg overtale. Jeg gjorde det klinkelig klart at jeg har ikke gjort noe av dette her. Og det er årsaken til at jeg kan gi det intervjuet, sa jeg til Tønne, at jeg har ikke gjort noe. Derfor sier ikke en far for meg å gi det dette intervjuet. Og men jeg brukte vi fra ham for at det skulle bli litt mer sånn... Det var jo veldig teatralsk, og jeg var jo 19 år gammel, og jeg synes dette var morsomt da. Jeg hadde litt sånn stor veldig under hele intervjuet, og veldig sånn fakta og sånn. For at du får gjøre mer, hva skal du si, troverdig, eller mer vanvittig egentlig, da. provosere masse mulig, sånt. Nevertheless, the day after the interview, Varg was arrested and jailed while being investigated for the church burnings. The interview was published the day Varg was arrested, and the article took liberties with much of what Varg said, according to him. I told them that uh, we were behind the church burnings and all this. And I told them I could tell them that because, of course, I have not done anything. And, uh, and uh, of course, he changed everything. And instead of uh, printing what I told him, he went to the police and got me arrested. And then he printed his interpretation of what I said in the newspaper. I could not do anything about it. I was in prison. And of course, all the other journalists interviewed him while I was in prison, and I couldn't say anything about it. So his uh, version was like the truth. Everybody copied it. You know? Although in prison, the scheme worked, and with media attention outside of musical journalism, more and more people became interested in black metal. Are you worried about your friends getting into trouble? <laughs> <laughs> no, we were zoning at the time. I didn't worry uh, about anything, basically. Uh, I guess I wanted to uh, set fire myself. Never went that far, you know. <clears throat> but no, uh, I mean, the only thing that was worrying is when it was all over the news. With media attention focusing around the black metal scene at an unprecedented rate, it wasn't long for the media to want to get in touch with the leader of the black metal scene. In early 1993, Euronymous himself cut an interview with Swedish Radio to discuss the recent happenings regarding black metal. Åtta norska kyrkor är är nedbrända och black metal bandet Bursums Count Grishnak eller Greven då som är åtalad. Hur, hur ligger det till egentligen? Han uh, gick ju ut i ett intervju då i uh, en avis i Bergen. 
og hvordan sant han hadde gjort det på vegne av sin sekt ikke? det var hovedsakelig en planlagt eh, eh, reklamekampanje for å få jævla mye oppstyr rundt Bursund og han har sagt at det er verdt å sitte inne en 3-4 år for å få den reklamen eh, hvorvidt han har gjort det eller nei, det skal vi ikke kommentere her men eh, vi regner med at han kommer til å bli slippt fri ganske snart, på grunn av at politiet har ikke bevis mm. det var ikke ett eneste bevis og ikke ett vitne er det et legitimt medel at, at ta til at brenne ned kyrker? Vi mener at hvis det brenner en kyrke, så får vi akkurat den samme funksjonen som vi pratet om i sted. De kristne, de, de vil samles. De vil skjønne at det er noe mer her i verden enn å bare gå rundt og være god. Det er en, eh, de vil ha den følelsen av at det er en ond, destruktiv kraft som de må kjempe mot med alle midler. Og ergo så blir de mer ekstreme og vi mener også at brenner det i kirke så er det ikke bare de kristne som lider, men folk flest også tenk for eksempel en vakker gammel stavkirke, hva skjer hvis den brenner? jo, en, de kristne blir fortvilet, to, Guds hus blir ødelagt, tre vanlige mennesker lider av sorg for at kirka var så vakker hvorfor skal man ødelegge den? ergo man sprer sorg og fortvilelse hvilket er meget bra while the wanted attention from the media brought in new interest to black metal and new customers with it, it also unfortunately brought in some new unwanted attention from the police. TV stations and papers didn't know they could connect it to an existing scene. They first thought this is one guy. It became evident pretty fast they will connect it to the shop of Euronymous. A lot of people who had been involved with the crimes thought this is going too far. Up until then, the cops didn't have any evidence against any of us. While Varg was imprisoned, Euronymous, at his parents' insistence, shut down Helvet, making Varg's ruse that cost him a few weeks in jail all for naught. Because of this, tension began to grow between the two. Despite this, Burzum's Ask EP was released in March 1993, featuring a picture of the burned Phantomstaff church. Copies also came with a lighter. It also features one of, if not my personal favorite Burzum song, Stem and Fra Tunnet. After the release of Ask, Burzum left DSP, and Varg formed his own label to release Burzum albums, Simofane Productions. Later that year, Varg released Burzum's second full-length album, Det Sam and Gangvar. My personal favorite off that album would be Key to the Gate. But the album is best known for the song Han Sam Rizit, an electronic and synth track. <music> Apart from that, 1993 gave us some amazing follow-ups to many of the original releases from 1992, such as Immortal's Pure Holocaust. The album cover featured prominent Norwegian black metal drummer Grimm on it and credits him for playing drums on the album, but the drums were however recorded by Abbott. Speaking of, he noticeably changed his vocal style on this album, and the music on this album went in a more technical direction. Though this time the album did not feature a lulzy music video. The emerging band Emperor released their first self-titled EP in 1993. They were joined by Countrymen Enslaved, who released Ordainsland. A 
A few weeks later, the two EPs were combined into a split album. But another popular band to join the fray was Satyricon, with their debut album Dark Medieval Times. The band's drummer Frost would join the ranks of Hellhammer and Fenris as one of the genre's most celebrated drummers. As for Dark Throne, third time was a charm when they released their first pure black metal album and third album overall under a funeral balloon. Nocturnal Culto changed his vocal style from the ghostly wails from a blaze in the northern sky to the recognizable black metal shriek most people think of when they imagine black metal vocals. The guitar on this album was also buzzed the way black metal guitars should sound too. And on the topic of guitars, Under a Funeral Moon would sadly be the final album to feature Sapphires on guitar, as he would quit the band for unclear personal reasons shortly after. Nevertheless, it seems Under a Funeral Moon is considered to be Dark Throne's greatest album. And while it's not an opinion I share, it's not one I would vehemently argue against either. It is indeed one of their finest works, and perhaps the finest release of 1993 of the Norwegian bands. But outside of Norway, other black metal bands were just about to get their start. By 1993, it seemed the Swedish death metal scene of the late 80s and early 90s was starting to lose its appeal, even in its home country. And so, extreme metal in Sweden began to shift. Sweden began to produce its own black metal bands that would rival the scenes in neighboring Norway and neighboring Finland. Of course, Sweden already had black metal bands such as the influential Bathory, then you had bands like Satanic Slaughter, Dawn, Tiamat, Marduk, Lord Belial, and also Abruptum, who were signed to Euronymous' Death Like Sounds Productions label. But it wasn't until 1993 that Swedish black metal was truly underway with the formation of bands like Arcanum, Dark Funeral, Diabolical Masquerade, and Funeral Mist, to name a few. There was also one band who stood out from the rest. The band that arguably put the first melodic black metal album out on the market. And that band would be Dissection with their 1993 debut album, The Somber Lane. Unlike the Norwegians often making musical blitzkriegs with harsh production, Dissection showed it was possible to make black metal and make it as melodic as Iron Maiden and Judas Priest while still giving it a harsh sound. The album was not only a classic among black metal fans, but was also an influence on the emerging Gothenburg scene. Gothenburg is a city in Sweden that was home to many a bands who would later popularize melodic death metal, bands like At the Gates, In Flames, and Dark Tranquility. Though it's worth noting the first melodic death metal album was also released in 1993, not by a Scandinavian band, but by an English band who originally pioneered grindcore and gore grind, the band Carcass, with their album Heartwork. As for Dissection, the band would later join the ranks of the Norwegian bands in terms of controversy for murder and suicide, but it would still be many years away. In Finland, their black metal scene was starting to be taken seriously by the outside world. Earlier, I mentioned many of the Finnish black metal bands started independently from the Norwegian scene, and many of the bands formed as black metal bands before the bulk of the Norwegian bands did. Prior to 1993, there was the aforementioned Beherit, but also Barathrum, Archgoat, Black Crucifixion, Diaboli, Thy Serpent, and Impaled Nazarene. By 1993, they would be joined by Horna, Dawn of Relic, and Darkwood Might Bethroned. In 1993, 
the first full-length releases from the Finnish bands started to come out. Impaled Nazarene released not one, but two albums in 1993. Toll Kormt's Norse 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 was their first album. And Ugra Karma was their second. While Impale Nazarene's output sounded kind of similar to what the bands of Norway were printing out at the time, they nevertheless expressed disdain for the Norwegian scene by printing linear notes on their first album that read, No orders from Norway is accepted and death to the assholes of Norway. Beherit, on the other hand, shifted from their pioneering war metal sound of their earlier days to create one of the most unique atmospheric black metal albums of all time, their debut album, Drawing Down the Moon. Beherit once again created something unique. They were able to create a black metal classic using guttural whispers, haunting atmospherics, and often mid-paced guitars and drumming. Like Dissection, they showed there was more to black metal than just high-pitched shrieks, blast beats, and tremolo-picked guitars. As for the conflict with the Norwegian scene, Beherit's leader, Nuclear Holocausto, would often prank call Mika Lutinen of Impaled Nazarene by playing cassettes of children's songs on high speed in the middle of the night, with Mika for the longest time believing these prank calls were being made by the Norwegian bands as threats. These prank calls, however, were perhaps the most harmless of what was to come in 1993. While the murders associated with the Norwegian scene often get the most attention, there were others that happened around that time in other countries that just don't get the same attention. Back in Germany, the teenage prodigies and absurd just got their start by making music videos and demos which jump right into the criminal acts often associated with black metal. Drummer Hendrik Mobus praised the church burnings in Norway, but what got him and his band in trouble with the law is what happened in April 1993. As the story goes, Sandro Bayer, a classmate of theirs, was aware of the band's singer and guitarist, Sebastian Schausale, was having an affair with another student's mother, and had been trying to warn other students of the band's satanic and fascistic activities. On April 29, 1993, Hendrik Mobus' girlfriend was able to convince Bayer to meet with the band and try to settle their differences. Instead, Bayer was then taken to a shack in the middle of the woods where the band strangled him to death with electrical cords. The members of Absurd were subsequently arrested, tried, convicted, and imprisoned for the murder. They still continued their music from behind bars, initially under the name In Ketten, German for In Chains. According to Mobus, prior to the murder of Bayer, Euronymous considered signing Absurd to Death Like Sounds Productions though there doesn't seem to be any evidence to back up that assertion or anyone else who has ever come forward to verify that. Later on, the band would be known as the first proper National Socialist Black Metal Band, or NSBM Band for short. National Socialist Black Metal isn't so much as a genre, but a term to describe black metal bands that promote National Socialism or Nazi ideology. Lyrics with white power, anti-Semitism, pagan nationalism, anti-Christian sentiment, and lyrics supportive of National Socialism. Bursum and Graveland are also often associated as forebears to the movement due to their nationalistic beliefs and Varg's involvement with the Heathen Front, a far-right organization in Norway that promoted National Socialism and Norse paganism. Hendrik Mobus formed the German branch of the Heathen Front in the late 90s while on parole. But just a few months after Absurd's murder of Sandra Beyer, the most infamous murder in black metal was about to occur. Back in Norway, tensions within the black metal scene began to grow. 
Euronymous was also facing financial troubles with his label and with his store now closed, as well as other personal business dealings. His behavior also became increasingly erratic and began issuing death threats not only to Swedish death metal bands, but some of the Swedish black metal bands as well. But the most tension was particularly between Varg and Euronymous in the fallout of the Bergen's Tinder debacle. The upcoming Day Mysteries album had been recorded and was set to be released in late 1993. Varg had effectively quit Mayhem and formed his own record label to self-release his music. Although there was still an outstanding contract between Death Like Silence and his label concerning the release of Burzum albums by the former. Euronymous still owed Varg for the royalties on the first Burzum album in Asuka. The tension began to culminate in August 1993. Sometime before then, Varg became aware that Euronymous intended to use the signing of the contract as a pretext to ambush him with a stun gun, kidnap him, and then torture him to death while videotaping it. While Euronymous made idle threats in the past, in which he would tell pretty much everyone who walked into Helvet, this time he only told a select few people about his intentions, one of whom informed Varg and even let him listen in on a phone call in which Euronymous detailed his plans. To preempt this, Varg traveled to Oslo in the early morning hours of August 10th, 1993, with Snor Ruch. Varg intended to show up unexpectedly at Euronymous' apartment with the contract forcing Euronymous to sign it and never have to deal with him ever again. Instead, when Varg presented the contract, Euronymous attacked him first, and the scuffle ended with Varg stabbing Euronymous in the skull with a blunt boot knife. He was planning to, to, uh, to kidnap me. He was planning to knock me out with an electro-shock pistol like the type that security guards carry and um, tie me up, take me into the forest and uh, make a snuff film while torturing me to death. And of course, uh, <laughs> I took it serious. And apart from that, he just... If you were talking about it, like in the shop to everybody and anybody, I wouldn't have taken it serious, but he didn't. He just told, you know, a select group of friends. You know, and one of them, you know, told me. The only reason he, he had to contact me was a contract between Bursum and his label. So he sent me the contracts, he wanted me to sign them. And he wanted to meet when we were signing them. Okay? I don't there's no reason to wait. Let's just go to Oslo and get done with it. So I drove to Oslo. It took some time to reach. I think we were there at uh, 3 o'clock or maybe 4 o'clock. So he was sleeping. I told him, well, I don't care if you're sleeping, just open the door. And he opened the door, uh, which is rather strange, really. You know, he just opened the door. And uh, even though he had plans to kill me, and uh, when I, he had this beeper, you know, and uh, when I got up in the apartment, he, uh, he panicked because you know, he probably, you know, he had plans to kill me. He, uh, I was aggressive, you know, so he panicked. He attacked me, he kicked me in the chest, I just threw him to the ground. Uh, a bit stunned, really, because, you know, he attacked me, you know. I didn't expect it at the, at the time. And uh, I was stunned for a while. He was just sitting on the floor, and suddenly he got up, trying to, to get his knife in the kitchen. And uh, I thought, well, if he's going to have a knife, I'm going to have a knife. So I had a pocket knife. So I just waited for, for, for well, what's going to happen. I just waited. Also, was on the floor. He, uh, he broke a, a lamp on the wall. So he was swimming in glass fragments uh, with, with uh, only his underwear. So he was rather bloody. Osset got up and attacked me again. So I finished Osset off. I uh, just, uh, you know, sh 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 what do you say, stab, shop, stabbed him in the skull, so he died immediate, uh, immediately. And I followed the other guy, but he ran to the car. So I managed to calm him down, you know, he gave me the car keys, I opened the car, you know, and uh, we drove back. At first, Euronymous's death was blamed on the Swedish black metal scene with whom Euronymous was on bad terms with. But ten days later, the police arrested not only Varg, but several other members of the Norwegian scene for various crimes associated with it. Interestingly, while many of the fans of the scene decried Varg as a traitor for killing Euronymous, more telling was the fact that most of the actual musicians who knew Euronymous personally and worked with him reacted to his death with nothing but cold indifference. For the first time in 2019, Necrobutcher himself admitted that if Varg hadn't killed Euronymous, then he would have. 
His motivation being how Euronymous tastelessly tried to capitalize on dead suicide, treating his bandmate more as a mean than a friend. Well, let's talk a little bit about the mysterious Dom Satanas. <clears throat> In the middle of the process of the songwriting and stuff, um, our buddy, Perolin, decided to take his own life. Long time. Still, actually, feel sorrow about that. But the first year was particularly bad, and uh, especially since my friend, uh, friend, Euronymous, took fucking photos of uh, his corpse. So that didn't help much with the grief I felt. I felt like I needed to go over and kill that Einstein, Euronymous fucking backstabber. But, uh, you know, it's uh, funny with the, bad, uh, with the karma, you know, bad karma there. Because uh, in... He went behind my back, uh, called uh, Wagi Vikernes, got him to play bass on the album, and uh, and then that was kind of bad karma, I guess, because we all know what happened to him. Um, uh, okay, I can just tell you it now, we can hold it in for many years, but actually I was on my way down to kill him myself, and... Uh, uh, when it happened, I just saw the morning paper. I'm thinking, fuck, I got to get home to my place and get out all, all the weapons and drugs and shit I had in my house because they're coming to my house because I'm probably going to be a number one suspect for this. Well, Euronymous was praised and respected for helping make the Norwegian scene what it was and help start the career of many bands. But as a person, he was regarded as arrogant and overbearing. He wanted to be regarded as the most extreme member of the Norwegian scene, but only participated in one or two church burnings because of peer pressure. And of course, he shut down his store because mom and dad told him to. On another interesting note, while Varg Vikerns, Rob Darkin, and Hendrik Mobus are credited with introducing far-right politics into black metal, Euronymous himself was a communist. Even more interestingly, Euronymous was not a communist because he believed in Karl Marx's vision of a stateless and classless world where workers own the means of production, but because in his misanthropy he supported the brutal dictatorships that inevitably happen when communism is attempted at being implemented. Euronymous admired communism's most murderous dictators such as Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot of Cambodia, Nicolae Ceausescu of Romania, and Enver Hoxha of Albania. In fact, Albania was Euronymous' favorite country because of how Enver Hoxha ruled the country from the end of World War II up until his death in 1985. Because of Hoxha being cited as an example of a Stalinist dictatorship other than Stalin himself, Albania was distant even from the other communist countries. Because of how isolated and underdeveloped Albania was from the rest of the world during the Cold War, Albania was often considered the North Korea of Europe, in letters that Euronymous would send to his pen pals, he would use the Albanian coat of arms from the communist era. Nevertheless, to this day, Euronymous's grave is considered an essential part of black metal tourism in Norway. The death of Euronymous would be seen as many as the death of the original black metal scene itself. The media circus that would follow would bring us to the final year of the original Norwegian black metal scene. With the Norwegian black metal scene already attracting media notice by 1992, the events of 1993 led the scene to become a full-blown media circus. The 1994 trial surrounding Varg and the other members became the largest media sensation in Norway and would be the largest noticeable event in the country until the Anders Breivik attacks nearly 20 years later in 2011. We'll look at the trial side in a bit, but 1994 also brought forth some of the most important releases of the Norwegian scene. While Immortal did not release anything in 1994, some of the other bands got their first full-length albums released that year. Among them include Enslaved, who, like Bathory, would help pioneer Viking metal. Not to be confused with melodic death metal with Viking lyrics like Amon Amarth, but an actual genre of music that combines black metal with Scandinavian folk music. And Slave's debut album would be Vikinger Veldi, an album with lyrics mostly in Icelandic. Due to the Icelandic language being the one language still spoken today, 
that comes the closest to resembling Old Norse, while the track Heimdallr has lyrics in Old Norwegian. Another important debut album would be Pentagram by Gorgoroth. Gorgoroth's earlier material would be some of the most celebrated black metal ever recorded. The band itself would have an interesting history in the years to come and would find new ways to keep itself, and perhaps the genre by extension, Still controversial even into the 2000s, the decade to follow, although for some people this was arguably for the wrong reasons. And another important debut album in 1994 would be Emperor Within the Night Side Eclipse. While many, even by 1994, began to complain that many of the Norwegian bands started to sound like each other, especially with the newer bands beginning to form, and some claimed that the genre was succumbing to tropes and trends, with spikes and corpse paint being an overused gimmick. However, Emperor decided to drop the corpse paint early on, which I think was unfortunate because I thought theirs, out of all the bands, was the coolest looking. But on the music side, In the Night Side Eclipse was the first symphonic black metal album to be released. The style of black metal opts to make a more epic sound, making use of keyboards, classical musical instruments, and backing choral vocals. In the band's later output, Emperor would begin to incorporate more progressive elements in their music. As for returning bands, Burzum released its third album, his Lyset Tiar Os, which Var considered a concept album. The album is also noted for containing the 14 minute electronic track. Dark Throne returned with Transylvanian Hunger, perhaps their best known album, even if it isn't necessarily their most celebrated. As I discussed in my video from 2015, the album has a lot of hype surrounding it, and for some the album just doesn't live up to it. Maybe they heard the title track or another song off the album. But the thing is, you're not merely supposed to listen to this album, you're supposed to experience it. This album is perhaps the most lo-fi out of all of Dark Throne's albums, and as a result, perhaps the harshest sounding record the band ever recorded. As explained before, to experience this album, wait till it gets dark out, Go to the darkest and coldest corner of your house, turn off the lights, close your eyes, and blast it on full volume. And if you do all that and you still don't feel like you're in Dracula's castle on a cold, stormy night, then I'm afraid nothing will ever help you truly appreciate atmospheric black metal. Now there is one more important album that came out this year. A debut one, in fact. Who is it from? It's a band we've been discussing almost this whole time. The band that started the Norwegian scene. The True Mayhem with De Mysteries Dom Santanas. Released ten years after the band formed, and as previously mentioned, it was originally meant to be released in late 1993, but the death of Euronymous delayed it. Though the album was recorded, it wasn't mixed yet at the time of his death. Shortly after Euronymous' funeral, Euronymous' family had asked Hellhammer to remove the bass tracks recorded by Varg for the album. Hellhammer pretended to oblige, claiming he intended to have the bass tracks re-recorded. 
Later, instead, Hellhammer claimed that he felt it was appropriate that the murderer and the victim were on the same record and kept the bass recordings as recorded by Varg in the final mix, contrary to the wishes of Euronymous's family. Hellhammer also reunited with Necrobutcher to help release the album. So, what was the end result of Hellhammer on drums, Varg on bass, Euronymous on guitar, and Attila Shazar on vocals? What would it sound like? The album demonstrated that Mayhem did not need to sound like the other bands they helped prop up. They nailed the atmospherics, and while Attila isn't as revered as Dead, his haunting operatic vocals on this album certainly helped make Day Mystery stand apart from the other albums being released at this time. Though Euronymous had stated if Dead didn't kill himself, the album most likely would have been released as early as 1992. After releasing Day Mysteries, Hellhammer and Necrobutcher decided that Mayhem would continue without Euronymous. They would soon hire a young, promising black metal guitarist by the name of Blasphemer. As for the media circus surrounding the trial of Varg Vickers, it all came to an end when Varg was convicted and sentenced to 21 years in prison, a maximum sentence for a crime in Norway. In one of the most iconic black metal moments of all time, when Varg is read his sentence of 21 years, all he did was look into the camera and smile. He would spend many years behind bars doing the occasional interviews. In 2003, he attempted to escape prison but was recaptured. In 2009, he was released on parole. Snorruch of Blackthorn, who accompanied Varg when he killed Euronymous, was sentenced to eight years in prison for being an accomplice. Faust of Emperor, when he was arrested, confessed to the murder of Magna Anderson and for several of the arson attacks on churches. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison, but was released after 9 years, in 2003. And Samat of the Ban Emperor was sentenced to 16 months in prison for his role in the church arsons. Following this, black metal began to inflate in Norway, and by extension the rest of the world. With Euronymous dead and many of its prominent musicians imprisoned, the Norwegian black metal scene would enter a steep rate of decline. Sure, many of the previously mentioned bands would still put out many great albums for the remainder of the decade and for many years after that, but the media controversy surrounding black metal brought a lot of the wrong people into the genre and would try to cash in on it while even some who were there from the start, or close to it, did the same. By the mid-90s, black metal music started to be featured on MTV, and while bands like Dark Throne, Mayhem, Burzum, and Emperor would remain respected bands of the genre, you had obscure upstarts like Dumu Borgir, who formed in 1993, only to become MTV pop stars by the mid-90s and throughout the 2000s. They were joined by another once obscure upstart band, this time from England, Cradle of Filth. Though some say really only the first one or two albums is black metal, then they became something of a more generic, gothic, and extreme metal band. And those two are just the go-to examples. Other bands like Covenant and Ancient, who are just as egregious as those other two, but they have seemed to be forgotten over the years. In the mid-90s and the years to follow the original scene, it was still a decent time with bands putting out great releases, but eventually the church burning stopped by late 1995, but in the late 90s and early 2000s, black metal was in a shitty mainstream phase. But controversy was still aplenty in those times, with John Nodviet of Dissection bringing murder to the Swedish scene with his role in the 1997 murder of a gay Algerian immigrant for which he was convicted of and was sentenced for 10 years. John was released from prison in 2004 and restarted his band, but ultimately committed ritual suicide in 2006. In 1998, a journalist by the name of Michael Moynihan published the most infamous book about black metal, The Lords of Chaos, detailing the events of the original Norwegian scene 
the events surrounding Absurd, though the name of the book was actually taken from a right-wing team militia that went on a crime spree in Florida in 1996. The book has been disowned by many black metal musicians for its sensationalized account of the original Norwegian scene, yet this didn't stop the book from getting its own film adaptation just a few years ago, directed by Johannes Ackerland, who was a one-time drummer in Bathory, but would later go on to direct several music videos, ranging from the Bewitched music video for Candlemass, the same one that Dead appeared in, to Paparazzi by Lady Gaga. In the same year Lords of Chaos was released, Gorgoroth picked up two new members who would shape the band's image for the next decade. A vocalist named Gaul on a bassist who went by the name The King of Hell. While Gorgoroth's musicianship went down during the 2000s, the two managed to keep controversy around the band and the Norwegian scene as an extension. Gaul committed a series of assaults in the early 2000s, including one incident where he tortured a man on his property, collected his blood in a cup, and then threatened to drink it. He went to prison at least twice during this time for several months. But the band's most infamous moment was the Black Mass concert in Krakow, Poland, which featured several live models who were crucified naked on the stage alongside actual sheep's heads mounted on spikes. The concert shocked the Catholic nation of Poland and caused the authorities to launch even a criminal investigation into the band, though it was eventually dropped. The incident even received media attention in the United States. Other than that, black metal has not really captured widespread media attention since then. You may hear of a controversy now and then, but nothing really comes close to the original Norwegian scene or the Krakow performance. The closest thing I could think of would be Graveland coming to do concerts in Canada a few years ago only to have Antifa shits threaten violence in order to force their cancellation. Then the Australian band Destroyer 666 having their 2019 tour of Australia and New Zealand cancelled because it might upset the sensitivities following the Christchurch shooting. As for black metal since the Norwegian scene, many would describe most black metal since then to be generic, uninspired, if not outright shit. And while it is maybe true for the most part, many if not most of the black metal to have come out since then really hasn't brought anything new to the table. There's still plenty of innovative bands here and there. And then you have channels like Black Metal Promotion who put out full-length classics of the genre and the new good stuff as well. Not going to mention standout new bands here, but it's safe to say that without the original Norwegian scene, we would never have gotten them. No matter how bad you think modern-day black metal has become, there was a time where it ruled the world. Black metal to this day is Norway's primary cultural export and when people think of Norwegian music, black metal usually comes to mind. Though of course, most European countries have their own black metal scene. Aside from the previous ones we mentioned, there was a French scene, there's a Greek scene, a Russian scene, a Ukrainian scene, and then even outside of Europe. The United States has a black metal scene, and then in the early 2000 teens, a black metal scene began to emerge in the Middle East, featuring bands that would blaspheme Islam as opposed to blaspheming Christianity. In closing, black metal has been my favorite music for more than 10 years at this point, though I've liked it since I was nearly 14 years old. I'm 28 right now, and black metal was important to me when I first started this channel back in January 2015, and with this video it still remains important to me now and probably always will be, at least for the foreseeable future. What about you, dear viewer? How long have you been a fan of black metal? Like any scene in particular? How about some bands you like? Like, comment, favorite, and subscribe to your heart's content. Be sure to check out my Rumble, BitChute, and Discord. And now Odyssey. I am the Black Lord of Fenrir. Slava, true Norwegian black metal. Slava.